So um, Evan's going to talk about um, FPG approximation algorithms, and this is one of three um, sessions that are going to happen over the next few days. So um, please enjoy. Yeah, thank you um, very much, uh, first of all, to the organizers for inviting me to come here. It's always a nice thing to be here in Singapore. And secondly, maybe there's a little difference between this title and the thing that Peter announced. So I'm not going to talk about FPT approximation, <laughs> but about FPT-inspired approximation. Um, the difference will become clear in a minute, I think. Um, so. Uh, maybe I can even start uh, without taking, uh, turning to my first or second slide in some, to some extent, because John Eyre already gave a nice example of, of what I, I would be talking about by telling us, well, we all know these FPT branching algorithms for, say, minimization problems. And at least if you're a uh, problem satisfies a property of which we might call um, a monotonicity property uh, that given S to be a solution like a set of something and if then something bitter, bigger like including this S should be also a solution. If this is true then what John Air was describing to us can be applied rather, rather universally. So take your favorite branching algorithm and turn it into an approximation algorithm. Um, and uh, I will be going a bit along this path, although I would rather focus on kernelization algorithms as opposed to um, branching algorithms as a kind of basis of something which can be reinterpreted to some extent as approximation algorithms. So that's the basic gist of it. Uh, but um, before I really start, I'd like to give you at least some, say, historical background, um, similar to what Eric did in his nice uh, talk uh, two days ago. Uh, before I really start into going into these thingies like kernelization and or versus approximation, um, probably on the second day, I will move into things known as local ratio techniques um, to also see there are some similarities, at least, to, to what I've done else. Um, and finally, coming to something which I call a Morginian reduction uh, for, for approximation, um, where I turn back to our good old friend Vertex Cover. Um, and explain how to uh, get at least, at fast, as far as I know, the better, uh, best um, uh, approximation algorithms for a degree bound, uh, no, not degree bounded, average degree bounded um, cases, um, basically based on reduction rules. So that's uh, the whole gist of it. And then I will also tell a little bit about experimental results and things like that. So turning really a bit practical then. Okay, um, let's start with origins, say. Um, one of the funny things is that um, papers on approximation algorithms pretty much predate things like NP-hardness theory. Um, so uh, you can find these in the 60s and maybe some Russian papers even earlier. I didn't try to get into that. So uh, uh, to me, uh, at least these Graham papers seem to be the earliest one you can find. Um, basically doing something like, well, uh, scheduling and things like that. Um, and of course, we all know the NP completeness theory also mentioned by Eric that probably Levin has many things sort of before Carpen Cook, but he didn't publish or dared to publish for some reasons. Uh, Eric explained. Um, well, and then there's this FPT world uh, that of course is, um, as its theory, 
uh, maybe started really with 91, 92 papers uh, that also Rod mentioned before. I think that, that were the ones the, you meant. Uh, yeah, uh, if, if somebody asked you about where FPT started, maybe that's uh, 91, 92, something like that. I think I wrote a little paper about the origins of the theater, and I think it was also affected at least in the mic, really. Oh, uh, the 87, something like that? Yeah. You mean, uh, okay, yeah, you can put it like that, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Thanks. Um, but um, to some extent, you can also say if you talk about FPT algorithms, that was done earlier, but not under this name, of course. If you look into Kurt Melhorn's textbook from '84, you will find exactly this two to the k branching algorithm analyzed that way uh, for for vertex cover that we all know of. Um, and also, there are more applied people like Ku Fuchs who did some, some uh, work on um, reconfiguration algorithms in, in VLSI. And they also mentioned, like, uh, this is like a quotation, well, our algorithm should be efficient for arrays with a moderate number of faulty cells, which is also something, nothing else than, okay, we have a small parameter. Okay. Um, Anyway, so this um, slide is also meant to tell you that what I'm going to approach in this um, mini course, as is it called, um, is a bit bold in the sense uh, that I'm trying to sell FPT techniques to some extent to approximation guys who pretty much predate it. FPT, whatever you count as, a, as the origins of FPT, it, it is like 20 years in between. Uh, so in this, case, in this sense, it's a bit bold because, of course, uh, the history and also the development of techniques in the approximation area is, mu in, to some extent, much uh, broader and maybe even richer. But, of course, FPT caught up in the recent years and um, uh, maybe it is really a good thing to start to exchange ideas, at least. Um, so, I mentioned this paper of Graham. And it's always fun to read these old papers. Um, and uh, this is one section, um, well, that I like to mention for some reasons. Uh, for instance, um, uh, he mentions something about empirical results using computer simulations. Well, also in those days, they, they did some programming and stuff like that. And what they actually achieved is um, typical results like, OK, um, we got uh, for our problem an approximation algorithm with a factor of two, basically, uh, of, of um, quality. But uh, what he tries to tell there with this uh, omega stuffy is that in practice, obviously the algorithm does something like factor 1.1 or better. Um, and this is, of course, an observation this is, that is very typical for most of our algorithms. They do behave much better than theory predicts in many ways be it running time, be it quality of what the, um, well, um, solutions, are, of the solutions produced. And so um, I will come back to this uh, later uh, in my uh, lecture to uh, advertise this a bit more. I think this is a really important bit. We shouldn't forget also to sell as, as theoreticians so that we are doing worst case thingies, but um, in many practical circumstances, our algorithms are far better. Okay, um, as I know that this is a quite diverse audience, I will wrap up some of the very basics. So I, I, I might be boring some of you, sorry about that, uh, but uh, wake up hopefully uh, early enough to catch up again. So um, 
I, I will talk about approximation. So it means I'm talking about optimization problems, which can be either minimization or maximization problems. Uh, while NP theory as such is basically dealing with decision problems. Um, and also SPT deals with decision problems, at least from uh, the very definition. That makes a difference as we, as we will see later. So approximation algorithms always produce solutions that need not be optimal, of course, otherwise they would be very handy exact algorithms. Um, and in order to assess the quality of approximation, we need some quality measure. Well, something like a size or weight or whatever this is called in the end of the day of a solution. And we compare this, at least in theory, with the best possible value. Well, there's a little hook there, of course, because it's really hard to tell this best optimal value. We are talking about hard problems, so we, can really don't, we don't really know this. So we have to do some um, estimates, which are often pretty bad. Uh, so this is one thing uh, one should keep in mind here. Um, and um, there are heaps of complexity classes built on, uh, on this idea. Uh, but the only thing I really need in this talk is APX, which is meant to be the class of optimization problems that can be approximated within a constant factor. Right, so... Um, this is basically all we have to know here. Well, parameterized complexity, on the other hand, um, deals with decision problems. Well, we have, on top of the classical decision problem, also something called a secondary measurement uh, parameter, often called K, in contrast to N being the size of the overall instance. And, um, FPT can be, as a complexity class, described equivalently by running times like O of F of K times P of N, where P is a polynomial, and F is some arbitrary, usually computable function, or by the idea of a problem kernel, which is a polytime computable self-reduction, so to speak, uh, which uh, is of size, well, g of k, where again g is some function um, which can be arbitrarily bad to some extent. The good news is both yield the same complexity class um, and um, if we really want to have something that works general, kernelization seems to be the way, uh, the way to do it just because this is a characterization. And um, that's also one of the reasons why I start out there, not with search trees, although John Ayer gave nice examples how to turn this into approximation as well. So that will be my starting point. And in the following minutes, I will try to explain, at least with one larger example, how to turn kernelization algorithms into approximation algorithms that are really competitive with the kind of current state of the art, uh, plus uh, telling the main issues about doing this. So there's, uh, it's not completely automatic, as we will see. Okay. Um, one of the ways to think about certain types of kernelization algorithms, now this doesn't work for, or it's not the overall view for everything, but at least for certain algorithms, it can be really seen like this. Um, you can think of, when you start studying your problem, of developing so-called reduction rules. If you haven't seen this term before, well, we come to examples soon. Uh, basically, there are simple local, reduction, uh, local modification rules of your instance 
that preserve certain properties. Um, once you start thinking about problems, these, these um, rules come to your mind more or less automatically. That's one of the funny things that happen. Um, but uh, you can be more systematic. Because if you have a concrete combinatorial problem at hand, often enough you find something which Mike would probably ca call a, a sort of on the shelf of the combinatorial shop. So uh, some, some results that mathematicians have proved on these problems, about these problems, um, often enough with non-trivial and even non-constructive arguments. And uh, the point is that you can take these things and combine them, at least in some circumstances, to uh, get condensation results, more or less immediately. Um, as I said, this doesn't work all the time, but sometimes at least. Especially if the um, optimization problems we're talking about are basically maximization problems, and if, um, uh, well, uh, the corresponding parameterized problem is kind of the natural parameterization. We will come to that. And what I want to describe is a bit um, how to use the same approach for, uh, in order to obtain approximation algorithms. And if I'm um, speaking about approximation algorithms here, I really mean the classical notion, so poly time. No FPT in this context. Of course, you can get something on top, maybe. So, try the same line. The problem that we will face is that this um, combinatorics shop often offers results which are obtained by non-constructive arguments, which is not a problem for FPT, but it is a problem for approximation. That's one of the main messages in the future. I will um, follow the path of basically focusing on one example in the following, namely on total domination. It's one of those better known, I would claim, variants of domination. Um, well, what's the definition? So you are looking, oh well, you're given a, an undirected graph, as is often the case, and you're looking for a set of vertices D such that for every vertex V of your graph, you will find a neighbor um, of um, this vertex in the dominating set. So, what is the difference to maybe more um, better known um, notion of a dominating set? Well, the, quest, the point is that also um, vertices from D itself need to be dominated. So, that's maybe the cru crucial difference. Um, it's open neighbor. Ah, yes, that's the other way to see it, yes. Yeah. Um, why did we pick this problem? Well, um, as can be kind of testified by having a whole book on this uh, subject, uh, there are lots of things known on, on uh, total domination. So it's not a problem that hasn't been studied at all, but just to the contrary, um, you can write books on it. Uh, so, and uh, what I'm telling you now is also contained in this paper I'm mentioning there. So, total domination is a kind of tough candidate in the sense that, well, it's not only NP complete to find a, a total dominating set of size at most k. Yeah, well. Um, but uh, it's also hard to approximate. Uh, it's W2 complete if you parameterize by K and so on. Um, so it's really hard to tell whether a certain 
solution is optimal. And just for the fun of it, uh, this is a rather simple example, of course. But still, I would claim it's not that easy to see whether or not this is the best you can do. So the best you can do means the red guys form a total dominating set. I hope you can see this. Um, but the question is, can we have smaller sets, smaller uh, total dominating sets for this graph? Mm, so in, just in case you get bored with my lecture, so just look at this example a bit. Um, you might find some better solution or not. Um, so because um, this problem is not FPT under certain uh, assumptions um, and also not in APX under certain assumptions. Um, so one way around, and actually this is one thing that happens quite often and systematically in the FPT world is to say, okay, instead of trying to minimize this set of vertices that should be a total dominating set, what about maximizing the complement of it? Well, um, also the approximation guys um, came to know this trick, so it's not that new on that world either. The only problem maybe be, uh, being the fact that FPT guys used to call this like a dual parameterization. And unfortunately, duality means something else if you look into the world of approximation um, because of the primal dual and whatever thing is there. Anyways, so um, that problem in turn of this kind of, say, parameterized dual problems often have, have their own namings, names. Mm, in this uh, case, this um, concept was also studied under the name harmless set with um, anonymity thresholds. So I will uh, stop uh, pronouncing these things in parentheses be, uh, because I don't use any other thresholds. I won't even introduce to you what a harmless set without these um, thingies is. Um, and also it's hard to pronounce for me. Uh, but anyways, uh, so a harmless set is nothing else than this complement set of a total dominating set. And as we will see, um, this approach is successful in the sense that um, this problem is both an FPT with a standard parameterization, or put it the other way around, if you um, consider the dual parameterization of total domination, then uh, we are in FPT. And it is in F APX if you consider it as a uh, maximization problem. Yeah? So this problem has been studied um, to some extent also from uh, this combinatorics point of view. Well, then again, you should usually look into um, total domination and translate the results. That's what I tried uh, to give in this table there. So I um, have something to say about the minimum degree of a graph, first of all, namely, if a graph contains isolates, well, for our problem, that's pretty easy uh, because there's no solution. Uh, so, um, therefore, in some case, we can ignore, kind of. Um, yeah. Yeah, to some extent, non-blocker is uh, the name um, kind of the often given, say, for this complement problem of dominating set, and this is now the complement problem for the total dominating set. 
Uh, yeah, 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 it's just this total T thingy coming in there. Um, but maybe it's good that you mentioned this. Maybe that's actually better now. So non-broker is something which people from FPT know, say, to some extent. Um, the funny thing is names. Uh, so that constant board actually introduced under the name enclaveless sets uh, by Peter Slater in the 70s. Um, somehow this name didn't catch on so much. Uh, but if you look into this problem from an approximation point of view, you shouldn't look for non-blocker, you shouldn't look for enclaveless sets, but it's there this, the star forest um, uh, uh, problem or something like that. So, um, so it's just a completely different name and you, Google would, wouldn't help you either because he doesn't know or doesn't know how to translate this <laughs> thing. So it's one of the fun things. So it's just a heap of names for, for the same stuff, basically. Anyway, so but thanks for the question. Um, returning to, to this little table, um, so, but maybe also coming back to non-blocker for a sec, um, because there the same thing happens. So uh, results depend on the, on bounds on the minimum degree. That's basically what I'm uh, telling you here. So you get better bounds if um, the minimum degree is not too small, put it this way. Um, so if I'm looking at this second line, so where I require the minimum degree to be at least one, which excludes isolates, the trivial case. So that's basically the most general case that's interesting. We know that um, any total dom dominating set contains, a uh, min minimum total dominating set contains at most two thirds of all vertices. Or the other way around, any harmless set any maximum harmless set um, contains at least one third of all vertices. Well, what does this mean? It does mean, at least uh, in the classical definition, that we have an immediate, completely trivial kernel for this problem, don't we? I mean, <laughs> if we have a parameter k now describing or upper bounding the size of the harmless set we are looking for, and this is larger than uh, n over three, then we can cry immediately, yes. Uh, no, sorry, no, uh, we can immediately, uh, once more, nee, yes, we can cry, yes, uh, no, I'm back. we can say yes. Um, there must be a solution. Unfortunately, we don't have it in our hands. But for the purpose of FPT, dealing with decision problems, that doesn't matter. Decision problems don't care about finding solutions. Um, in general, they do find solutions along the way. Yes, by branching or whatever. But in this particular case, they don't. And what's even worse, if you look into the proofs, that show these kind of results, um, well, they won't help you either because they are in general non-constructive. So you don't have an algorithm for that. Um, this means nothing bad for FPT by the very definition. But it is, of course, very bad if you look into approximation because there you really have to give some solution. So that's a crucial difference. And so something has to be done about that. And um, here's one way to actually make use of uh, this result that we have always a harmless set of size at at least one third of the number of vertices um, in a graph of minimum degree one. Um, that was given by Bas Ganesh 
Chopin in 014. Um, and I think I will tell you this a bit because it's interesting just to see how this can be um, done in a very smooth way in this, in this case. So, of course, um, I would say at least, I would claim, we can uh, restrict ourselves to the case of connected graphs. Well, otherwise we just do it uh, for each component. And so we just compute a spanning tree of our connected graph, which exists. And this spanning tree allows us to compute an optimum, an optimum total dominating set for this tree. This does exist. Um, and it can be um, computed in, in poly time. That's the most important bit here. And um, if I just take this uh, set, then it's also a total dominating set for the original graph. That's the main observation here. And um, because of the inequalities that we've seen before, it's clear that this is um, at least not worse in terms of harmless sets um, than basically taking all vertices in the harmless set, so to speak. So kind, kind of a trivial up about for, for the optimum solution because as I mentioned before, one of the problems with approximation is that we always have to compare with optimum solutions. Well, that's hard to have. So, so for maximization problems, often enough, just taking the whole set is some, some trivial bound that we can use. OK, so this is one way. Yeah? What's the C prime in the lab? Uh, OK, sorry. Um, uh, I should have read it before, yes. Um, uh, okay, no, no, the point is um, uh, the lemma is what I well, said in kind of uh, in passing. Uh, sorry, I didn't read it out. Uh, so I'm just considering some um, subgraph of G obtained by deleting some edges. So that's G prime. And that's actually what I do now by computing computing the spanning tree. So that is a subgraph like that, like the G prime. And the only thing is that um, I need this kind of trivial assertion that I can take a total dominating set of this smaller graph and sell it as a total dominating set for the overall graph. Does C prime have to be connected? Uh, no. I mean, uh, the only point is that, I mean, uh, I, to, uh, I am dominating everybody in this subgraph. And then I am dominating everybody in the supergraph. So, um, I mean, this is really trivial. Sorry, um, uh, um, I sh maybe I shouldn't have omitted it completely. <laughs> so, um, uh, but uh, this is... Yeah. Probably you can start with, so instead of having a spanning tree, you might have something like a matching, for example. But that yeah. probably, even a dominant, is easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you, can, you can do other things. I mean, this is just one way to make use of uh, this combinatorial result that I mentioned before. And that's what I wanted to do. Uh, the only thing is, I wanted to have this. Um, factor of three approximation, basically, uh, go, uh, uh, or, um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, um, that's the only thing I wanted to have, yeah? Sorry, just to be sure, yeah. Time, uh, does not have to be an optimal total dominating set back into the graph. After adding that, I just do various smaller total dominating sets. Uh, so I, I'm computing this um, optimum thingy Sorry, uh, because I want to apply, um, okay, maybe I didn't explain it well enough. Um, so I want to apply uh, this result here, so that um, I know that um, the optimum harmless set, and now I'm, I'm applying this to this 
a spanning tree. So and therefore, um, this is this factor uh, three. But of course, as n doesn't change, and as still a solution, I have also factor three for the rich and instance. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so there might be some funny things happening. So, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, so my whole point here was uh, to say, to tell you, okay, for the kernelization thingy, this was not necessary. I mean, there I can simply say yes, and I don't care how to get the solution. Well, of course, in practice I do, but this is another thing. Um, but uh, for the approximation, just by definition, I must somehow m make some effective use of it. And that's how we can do it, at least here. Okay, this was meant like a warm-up, I must say. <laughs> so, um, uh, of course, uh, we'd like to um, have some better results. And as I said, we have some ideas how to do it from these um, lines. So can we use the second line, for instance? So if you want to do this, we must get rid of degree one vertices somehow, obviously. Um, or if we want to use the third line, OK, even the degree two vertices are in our way. So somehow we need to deal with them. And now, um, the ideas from, well, that we as FPT guys I used to work with come into play. Because, well, if you look into some graph problem, then often enough, we can easily find reduction rules to deal with small degree vertices, for instance. I mean, this is one of the classical things we do. And uh, so can we use this same trickery to get um, approximation algorithms? So that's basically the, so can we find rules to cope with vertices of degree one? Um, well, unfortunately, no general degree one rules, no. Hmm. Um, and even if so, okay, what I didn't, or what I failed to explain so far is how to use this actually for approximation. And well then, if we manage to do this somehow, what about vertices of degree two? Or maybe we can even find nicer or more fitting uh, combinatorial results if we go back to our library and look a bit. Well, but still, if we start working with this problem, we will easily find reduction rules like the following ones. Um, assume we have two vertices of degree one attached to the same vertex. So they are kind of twins. Okay? So, well, basically, this vertex here is telling, take this into the dominating set. And this is giving the same message. So what we can do is basically we can delete one of them. So that's an easy and direct rule that you can think of. Um, secondly, if we have a long chain of vertices, and with this picture I mean that all the guys in the middle are really of degree two, and these could be of higher degree. And what I'm proposing is basically to delete all three vertices in the middle, like the degree two vertices, and connect the box vertices in this example, right? Um, which is actually quite similar to what people might know of as folding rule for vertex cover. Um, but we need one more, uh, or more vertices to, to work with. And 
If you look into it with more detail, you will find some more hooks like what if this is on a cycle and what if we have long paths dangling in one uh, direction, sort of like pendant um, paths uh, on one vertex, and you can have many similar rules. Um, I'm not giving you everything here, but just to have a feel about this. Okay, um, so uh, this looks like we can deal at least with some degree one vertices and some degree two vertices, not with everybody. Okay, um, but for instance, with our graph, this already works out pretty fine. Just incidentally, we have uh, twin leaves, um, so we can remove them. And um, also incidentally, we find these long chains, and we can try try to shortcut them a bit. Um, okay, uh, so we can do something with the graph. At least uh, this would be the thinking uh, if we look at it from this more parameterized thinking. I mean, I didn't talk about how the parameter evolves, but um, it's pretty clear how it, how it does. I, I wouldn't uh, be too uh, much wasting the time on this. Um, of course, also nice, um, these kind of local rules. This is one of the big advantages, actually, of, of, of the reduction rules can mostly be implemented quite efficiently. So they do run quickly. I mean, if you really try to implement things and run things, this is a really important issue. And um, also, and this would, is of course important to what we are going to uh, deal with in the following, one can show that um, if by applying these kind of rules, uh, a graph G gets transformed into a graph G prime, say, uh, and somehow, in whatever way, we get a factor alpha approximation for G prime, then we can undo these reduction steps and prove that we can also get a factor alpha approximation for G, including, in this case, the kind of exact um, special case when alpha is one, which is yeah, nothing else than telling, okay, I have an exact solution. Um, notice that in this case, I didn't make use of the possibility to have something like approximate reduction rules. This is, of course, also possible. We will see this later, uh, like examples for that. But in this case, I want to stress also this fact that we can deal with the exact cases in the same way, like running, having exact algorithms for this. Um, plus some things like self-monitoring approximation, which I will talk about later. This incorporates this as well. And it's not possible if you have some uh, like arbitrarily bad, maybe, approximations in between. Okay, um, so if we do these and similar rules, I must say, um, exhaustively, then we will find especially uh, that uh, we have no three consecutive vertices of degree two, and we have no vertices of degree one that have twins. Um, so this is exactly what these rules do get rid of these guys. And um, why I'm mentioning this, first of all, um, reduction rules are not only shrinking your graph, that's at least the basic idea of reductions just by the name of it, but it often also helps to get additional structural properties of your graph. And uh, this is what I try to make use of in the following. Um, namely, if we go a bit more through our combinatorialist shopping, 
um, more than we might find the following result. If a graph G of order n has no vertices of degree one and no three consecutive vertices of degree two, then we have a, an upper bound on the number of uh, vertices in a best um, total dominating set, which is incidentally the same as I showed before on my list for um, having no degree uh, two vertices at all. Now, this is one of the funny things. I don't know why, but this happens to be the case with, with total vertical cover. Uh, to, sorry, total, total dominated set. OK, anyways. Um, this is quite a hopeful result in the sense that, obviously, the only problem, but well, of course, this is a problem, that we are still left with are leaves. Maybe a bit surprisingly, because usually they look so harmless. But maybe they are not. So can we get rid of them somehow? Or do something else with them? Um, well, we cannot do this in the sense of um, kernelization. And now we start to differ uh, with these two things. So we, at least I don't know how. Um, but uh, we can further modify the graph in a maybe unexpected way uh, to get something where we can use this result of Laman Way. At least try to use it. I mean, using it is another story because if we cannot use it, it's again a non-constructive proof. So <laughs> we cannot directly uh, get this approximation factor that we want, but this is another issue we come to this later. So, um, namely, what we do is the following. We basically um, take our graph and double it, take two copies of it. This is not what we want to do in kernelization, not at all. Uh, but in terms of approximation, this is pretty fine. Um, and what we then do is we connect um, the um, uh, sort of corresponding leaves, if you understand what I mean. So maybe I can just switch to the picture. Well, you might recall our original graph. I just mirrored it because it's easier to draw than, and then you interconnect the corresponding leaves. Um, and then I want to apply an algorithmic version of the result of Laman Way. As I mentioned, we cannot immediately take that for, as a result in itself because it's non-constructive, so it wouldn't work. Um, and using this, um, we get first a, a factor two approximation for the reduced graph, and then undoing reductions, we get a two approximative solution for the original graph. That's the basic idea here. And act actually, we can do similar trickery for non-blocker, um, as uh, you mentioned this, um, based on some other uh, results. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in that case, for non-blocker, um, that is not beating the currently best thingy. So they, um, but it was the case with harmless set. Okay, um, so we will get to uh, this kind of, uh, sorry, uh, maybe, um, uh, sorry, um, I d didn't read this correctly. So I'm not connecting the leaves, I'm deleting the leaves and connecting them non-leaf neighbors, sorry. So this is giving rise to this picture basically. Uh, so, or more precisely to this graph here. And now, say we believe in uh, that we can get some relatively small dominating, a total dominating set for um, this new graph by Laman Way. There is something hidden uh, below the carpet here, but um, let's take this as a black box for now. Um, and Based on this, I have now, uh, well, have to massage this solution again to get some more or less good um, 
total dominating set uh, for um, the original graph. And um, this is based on this little theorem that basically tells you that um, if I have a graph um, height obtained by a graph G by deleting some vertices and possibly adding some edges, that's exactly what we do in our construction, of course, therefore it fits, um, not quite coincidentally. Uh, so, um, and we have a certain bound on, um, on um, the size, uh, the difference of the sizes of both uh, uh, well, uh, solutions that we are considering. And some more technical stuff is happening. Mm, maybe I sh really shouldn't read it. Then all of a sudden we uh, know that the harmless set thing is working out nicely. Well, just to make sure that we understand at least a little bit, this little c here is this bound on the total dominating set given by Lam and Wei. So this is 1 over 2. And so this expression over here, after a little bit of computation, you get its factor 2. And that's exactly what we want to have for our harmless set. So, um, and, well, probably I won't go through this uh, also three-line proof, but you see it's, it's not a hard proof, so at least that's what you can see um, to get there. Okay, so um, this means I have a way, and now I'm again sweeping things under the carpet. Um, I have a way to get from the solution of this kind of um, two-copy version of my graph uh, to something which is not too bad for the original graph, um, which looks like this in this case. And um, undoing reductions, I will arrive at this solution. And I know that this is a at worst factor two approximation for um, my original problem, although I would claim in this case it's even optimal. And especially, it's, uh, the thing is better than the solution I presented in the very beginning, as you, if you uh, have this still in your mind. So uh, therefore, it also shows that especially, at least this is shown here, um, that the solution I gave before is not the best one, because this is a better one. <laughs> so uh, this is at least what I can see here. OK, so um, let me summarize a bit what we did so far. And maybe this also point to stop then in order to continue next time. Um, so when does this approach work? First of all, we, technically speaking, we would need a notion of something like approximation preserving reduction. I didn't do this so far. I will do next time just to have a more formal setting around, but this was just an introductory example, say. And um, if um, oh, this notion will be such that if it is like approximation f uh, preserving for everybody, then it's mostly uh, um, also working as a kernelization rule in the classical setting. And of course, we have to look for these algorithmic uh, combinatorial results, and I'm underlining algorithmic here, because, as I said, often enough, uh, these um, combinatorial results are proved by uh, extremely combinatorial methods, which makes them non-constructive. So you cannot see, really tell the algorithm, at least if you just stare at the proof. So just take some optimal solution with these and these properties and do something. So it um, doesn't work this way. And um, uh, so, uh, if uh, we uh, have some uh, additional properties, we can often massage the solution. That's basically the point there. We will see this in another, another example next time. Um, what I've told you so far, unfortunately, does not work 
and that way for minimization problems. So uh, it's a bit of a drawback, but uh, we will come to some other methods which preferably seem to work for minimization problems in a similar setting. Um, but so as I said, in this paper, I mean this paper that I was mentioning before, we consider some examples of, say, to wrap it up, complements of domination-like problems, um, like harmless set variations of non-blocker or the differential. That's what I will talk about next, um, well, maybe next time. Um, maybe tomorrow, I think. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, maybe I stop here um, for uh, the sake of this presentation. Yeah, uh, thanks for your attention, first of all. <laughs>